Welcome, everyone, uh, to TechCon 23. We hope you enjoyed uh, our sessions today. It is uh, great having you all connected at home uh, and in uh, offices all across EMEA and APEC as well. Um, we had many contributors. Um, so uh, like from, from right here in Tel Aviv, a big shout out to all of the presenters, hosts, organizers, and especially attendees. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci said it the best, uh, learning never exhausts a mind. <laughs> what yeah. we're all about, yes, what we're all about at TechCon. Um, so today we're in for a treat. Uh, we're going to talk with an extraordinary, extraordinary person, um, an internet pioneer. Uh, we'll talk about the evolution of the internet. Um, and we're celebrating Vinternet, uh, the internet's 50th under anniversary. We'll also get a glimpse into the future, uh, uh, what's going to happen in the next 50 years. Uh, no promises. We'll play some fun games and uh, get in. Um, we'll touch base on the interplayer, interplanetary obsession that we have. Um, my personal favorite. And um, we'll also share what can the evolution of the internet teach us going forward, how it all started, and what's the, the next big milestone. So uh, without further ado, our next guest is Vince Cerf, or should we say uh, back by popular demand uh, to our oh. show. <laughs> As we've spoken a few times before, by the way, if you missed our previous session, um, you can catch it on the Google Cloud YouTube channel. Um, we're getting a lot of good reviews on that. Um, and I mean, uh, obviously to you, thanks uh, a lot for, for participating, uh, Vint. So Vint doesn't need um, a ton of introduction. He's born born in 1943, studied uh, and also teach at Stanford. He worked on the ARPANET. He co-developed a little tiny thing, uh, not very important, called the TCP/IP, which everything is built on and <laughs> leverages it. Uh, obviously, along with Bob Kahn, um, and many um, he also touched many cutting edge technologies, including new applications, uh, digital libraries, digital object architectures. Uh, knowledge ro robots, uh, gigabits ne gigabit networking, and more. Um, also touched on uh, NASA, NASA's next generation space communication architecture, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, he's the vice president and chief internet evangelist of Google. Um, an interesting, uh, fic uh, interesting fact about Vint is that he advocates and works on ass assistive technology and assistive situation. He sponsors accessibility for Google products and services. He's making sure that um, these things are taken into consideration early in the product design stage. Um, Vint, correct me if I'm wrong, you're also a huge sci-fi fan. Yes, so, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great fun fact. So um, I pulled up the Wikipedia definition that says imaginative and futuristic concepts, advanced science and technology, space exploration, time travel, parallel universes, and extraterrestrial life, which I find super powerful and also a bit quirky because uh, this directly applies to like the groundbreaking work that you've done in exploring technologies and, and having the applications of the internet, um, like we mentioned, the interplanetary internet. So just before we kick it off, um, a few more things about Vince. So he recently received, he received two outstanding awards. So the IEEE Medal of Honor, not the computer game, uh, for co-creating the internet architecture and providing sustained leadership um, in its phenomenal growth and becoming the society's critical infrastructure, like literally, and also uh, the Marconi Society Lifetime Achievement Award. So. This is for decades of selfless uh, devotion uh, to the advancements of the internet, uh, its technologies, and uh, numerous supportive organizations. Uh, this includes the uh, Marconi Society. Obviously, there are many more, of course, including the highly prestigious uh, ACM Turing Award, also known as the Nobel Prize for Computing. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> So without further ado, let me introduce you to the father of the internet, uh, Dr. Vinton uh, G. Cerf, uh, VP and Chief Internet Evangelist of Google. So uh, how are you today, Vince? Well, I actually thank you so much for the very kind words. Uh, if anybody wants any more, they can Google Vince Cerf and you'll find Wikipedia <laughs> and all these other things. Um, what uh, I'm still very excited about the internet, even though <clears throat> this has been going on now for 50 years. Bob Kahn and I started doing the design work in 1973, and there's still plenty of work to do. So if anybody is imagining that uh, the Internet is over and, you know, we'd better turn to something else, I have news for you. 
first of all, only about two thirds of the world has access to it. So we got to work on, on that, make it accessible, make it uh, affordable, make it sustainable uh, and uh, suitable for the uh, kinds of applications that we're now expecting. The one that we're using right this very moment is an example of why increased capacity has been so important for the internet. So uh, there's still plenty of work to be done uh, in many different dimensions, including inventing new ways of using it. An example of this is at Google, uh, looking at the TCP IP protocols and the conclusion of the team was that we could do that better uh, in particular because we were beginning to use cryptography as a way of protecting privacy during uh, transactions on the internet. And so Google uh, developed something that's called QUIC, Q-U-I-C, which has now been standardized in the Internet Engineering Task Force, and it's increasingly in use both when in our own systems here at Google and elsewhere uh, as a combining of the TCP functionality, the TLS security functionality, plus additional operational features that allow multiple streams to be coordinated within a single quick connection. So it's a very nice piece of work. Uh, that just shows you that the Internet's architecture, which was intended to be extensible, uh, is still admits of some new ideas, either in, in the uh, given layer protocol or even the addition of layers, which of course happened in uh, 1991 when uh, Sir, now Sir Tim Berners-Lee developed the hypertext transport protocol which layered on top of TCP or could be layered on top of QUIC um, and the HTML uh, format for uh, the description of web pages uh, and that's another example of a, of a major extension of the uh, internet structure and, and also what's super interesting is that back in the day security wasn't such a um you know, of that same magnitude of a pillar that you had to take that into consideration from like the, the I mean, well, the, actually the that's not, that that's actually not true. So let me, uh, let me disabuse you of that. A lot of people say, why didn't you put Please more security do. into the system? Uh, the fact is that starting around 1975, I began working uh, with the National Security Agency in the US to design a packet crypto capability that was needed for the internet. Is up to that time, the cryptography was for serial connections. Link, link level crypto, continuous crypto. We, and we needed to be able to- We know encrypt. today as MacSec in, in these types of uh, things. Uh, yes, so so now uh, we needed, uh, back then we needed to invent a way of doing uh, cryptography on a packet by packet basis. And oh, by the way, we needed to decrypt packets out of order, uh, which introduced some other requirements. Eventually the project, which was funded by ARPA, uh, led to uh, some specific military grade uh, cryptographic systems that are uh, have evolved over time. So we were focused on uh, security initially uh, because this was supposed to be used for the command and control system for su the support of the US Defense Department and its ally. So uh, we didn't push, however, a lot of those mechanisms into the system at, in the early stages for two different reasons. The first one is that uh, we didn't want to uh, rely on graduate students uh, who were most of the users and developers of the internet to, to manage their cryptographic keys. Uh, they're too distracted by exams and uh, getting their dissertation work done. And it would have impeded our exploration of the utility of packet switching for the application space that we were working in. So we deliberately held back on forcing that stuff into the system because in the early stages, this wasn't an issue. But I knew that the RSA algorithms and the public key crypto and all that could be retrofitted into the system along with the packet crypto capability. And so uh, it's not like we weren't paying any attention to it. It's just that we didn't force it in at the early stages because it would have impeded our ability to demonstrate that the system actually worked well for the kinds of applications that we now enjoy today. Sorry to uh, beat you over the head, but uh, no, that, no. I mean that, 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 that makes a lot of. Sense. I didn't mean to say that it's it yeah. wasn't included, but I mean nowadays there's like a oh, lot. Oh, it's a big deal. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, this is what happens. Like when, you said, you don't want a twelve-year-old hacking into the Pentagon, well, breaking into the interplanetary internet. That's not a good thing for well, any. Yes, when we started working on the interplanetary internet, the first thing I told my colleagues was, "I do not want to see the headline that says 15 year old takes over Mars net." I said, "We do not want that." So the interplanetary protocols have embedded cryptography and digital signatures and the like 
into the system from the very beginning. But not so on a per pack reason. basis, right? Uh, well, it's on a per bundle basis. Yeah, because the bundle protocol is used over there. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a ton of questions. Um, first, just to to kickstart um, um, with a, a quick fun word association, just to get us a bit more creative. Uh, if if it's okay by you, Vint, sure. you, you haven't been prepared for this, of course, but what are like the first thing that comes to mind or anything that you want to talk about when I say the following? Um, accessibility and disability. Um, you know, better tools for uh, overcoming the, the, do you want just a one word answer or do you want a sentence? or Whatever that, that you I want I want to make computers work better for people with disabilities. Right. I'm, I'm gonna let I'm gonna take two seconds to let that sink in because that is really really important um, next one is uh, internet society society society.org uh, well uh, immediately I think of the interplanetary uh, chapter the ipnsig.org which got started in 1998 so maybe this has been going on for 25 years uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, we originated that chapter so early on in the internet society's history which started as you will remember in 1992 and, and we're going to also uh, um, um, drill deeper on on that uh, really soon so the next one is uh, um, ethical uh, ai artificial intelligence a immediate thought is that we had better figure out a governance regime for the use of artificial intelligence and more generally software that has autonomous capability that we rely on to do things without touching anything. And if you don't mind, when you walk into an elevator that, you know, the elevators of today let you pick the floor you want to go to and then it assigns you an elevator. When you get into the elevator, there are no controls for which floors to go to. You're now relying on somebody else's software. That should give everybody a certain amount of pause. And that's just one example of the uh, increased dependence we have on other people's software. Those people should feel a great burden uh, for creating software which is safe and secure and reliable. And, and just to 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 um, <clears throat> piggyback on that analogy, um, to be honest, in in our building in, in Tel Aviv, we had uh, the, the the chip for the elevator was the code was written java you came to write to to choose the floor and you saw the the exception handler presented and you feel like i oh, am not walking into not, that i'm elevator. not getting into this elevator that's right <laughs> who knows i'll get stuck in the elevator what yeah yeah good point so uh just i mean it's, it makes a lot of sense all right next one sustainable technology well if we are going to survive global warming and uh, and internet's growth uh, with uh, power consumption and everything else, we had better think our way through how to sustain civilization uh, it better than we have today. Right now, we are at risk, so we have to work hard. Maybe some of the computing technologies will help us get better answers. Yeah, I also feel there's uh, there's a big um, uh, wave of of innovation coming in that uh, in that area. Also, like the the, it feels to me like a lot of the. Um, not only regulation, but a lot of the incentives are starting to to fall into the right place to make that happen, to allow that fruition to come to to, to allow that to come to fruition. Um, hyper automation. What do you feel about that? Uh, well, it's your friend in many respects because it lets you do more things. You know how they speak about many hands make uh, light work. Well, what if you have many hands? Uh, and uh, so these hyper automated systems give us many hands. Here's an example. When you do a Google search, think of how many hands are being exercised, figuratively speaking, to help find information for you. Now we have these uh, large language models. And in a sense, they are represent many hands as well. Right now, however, uh, we're suffering uh, from what the other phenomenon, which is too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, you know, interfering with each other and getting bad results, uh, like a poor, uh, you know, a, a, a dish being produced in the kitchen by too many different hands. And so we have work to do uh, to, uh, if we're going to pursue this analogy, to make make this a feast and not a garbage pile. Definitely. I mean, and we're gonna we're gonna also we have like maybe two three follow up questions on that uh, coming right up. Um, 
the next thing is Stanford. What pops to mind when I say Stanford? The winds of freedom blow. Uh, wonderful campus. I love the place. Uh, I was there for eight years. Uh, when was the last part. time you visited Stanford? Uh, uh, Oh, gee, uh, literally uh, in uh, late November of last year, uh, my daughter-in-law just joined the fine arts faculty. Uh, she's teaching uh, filmmaking, specifically documentaries. And so she has an office in the new fine arts building. And I wanted very much to go see that. So we went out to see our grandchildren and the Stanford campus. Nice. Nice. Um, all right. Um, quantum computing is the next one. Well, I'm very excited about the efforts at Google, in particular, Hartmut Nevin is uh, leading that effort. And uh, he and I had a conversation just recently. Uh, and the big challenge at this moment is to create a very large number of physical qubits that can be used to represent a logical qubit. And the reason we need to do that is that we need to have what's called error correction mm -hmm. in order to allow uh, a quantum computation to go on long enough to a result in an answer that, that we can use. Uh, today, maintaining entanglement is hard, and the easiest way to maintain it is to have multiple qubits so that we can use them to do error correction and sustain the computation. Uh, Hartman has shown me uh, his thinking about how to achieve this large scale, you know, maybe 100 or even 1,000 qubits per one logical qubit. Uh, and so I'm now very convinced that he has a roadmap very excited about that. I, I remember that the last breakthrough mm -hmm. was on the number of qubits, right? That's kind of the, the, the last. And what is like the first application that comes to mind? With well, the, ob the obvious one is Shor's algorithm, which is the you know, break uh, uh, the, uh, the use of uh, the product of large primes to provide work factor for cryptography. But I'm actually much, much more interested in optimizations where, uh, where we have large complex the traveling uh, salesman problem. Like solving the, the unsolvable, as as yeah, we used to. Yeah, uh, yes, or or at least getting you know close to uh, close to a, a good answer, uh, which we might then uh, refine. So if you go way back into the 1950s, we used to have uh, a combination of analog and digital computing. The analog computing didn't get you very many digits of accuracy, but it might get you close to an answer. Mm -hmm. And then you take that and run that through uh, a, a a finite difference analysis in order to refine the answer. We might end up with quantum computing doing the same thing. We might get very close to the right answer and then use purely digital techniques in order to refine that to, for precision. That is that is super interesting because that allows us to take like the mm -hmm. unsolvable problem, break that down to like two chunks, one big one, let quantum computing try to tackle that and then do the little little stuff with uh, with what we know is today. Um, all right, uh, two last ones. Um, Multi-experience in the metaverse. Uh, I'm still scratching my head about what's the metaverse. Uh, and I also uh, find that uh, sticking uh, those uh, 3D goggles on your head uh, makes me think of, you know, the science fiction movies where some alien glues itself to your face. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that any of us is going to want to wear those things for a long, sustained period of time unless you happen to be an absolute inveterate uh, game player uh, who, uh, who is addicted to... Uh, That's a strong use case, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, however, I do think that these 3D environments uh, will be of some significant use, especially where you're exploring simulations. Uh, with multiple parties observing that simulation in the simulated space and interacting with it. Um, examples are complex processes like rocket engines uh, that are firing and are producing uh, res you know, uh, resonance problems that shake the engines apart. Sometimes you can't understand that without actually looking at the live simulation and watching the effects uh, occur. So uh, joint work, just like with the Google Docs where we work together, I can imagine uh, these 3D environments where we work together. The second thing, which is related to metaverse, is uh, augmented reality, where we're taking real world images and we are uh, annotating them. Uh, that could be helpful to a blind person for navigation. It would be helpful for a tourist who's wondering where the hell am I and what is that building? Uh, it could be helpful for someone who's trying to put something together or fix a broken uh, object uh, to show them uh, literally in the in the 
uh, space that they're in exactly how to put those pieces together so so i mean also i mean there's like a huge use case for medicine right for the in the world of biology and medicine sometimes the um, the two dimension that we perceive through our our, our eyes are, is not sufficient doesn't have enough enriched data for us to feel. just like you said sometimes you have to see it you have to more kind of feel it to to better understand it and then solve it well in fact there are some examples of this uh you know the mri scans uh, can be used to build a three-dimensional model you mean uh, a, have... a gigantic magnet uh yeah well well the, the mris are gigantic magnets but it's the output uh, that we're interested in. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had an operation where the uh, surgeon was actually using a 3D view of his body uh, that was generated by an MRI scan in order to guide uh, the surgery. And that was you know, a very impressive demonstration of how the melding of those technologies together uh, makes, uh, makes for a much more um, effective treatment. Absolutely, and I think it's 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 a great example of um, also. It's not only about doing it; it's how you need to be accurate, and you need to think about. I mean, a lot of different angles. So coming back to not only accessibility but security and so forth. Um, all right, last one we have is uh, digital sustainability. Uh, well, my immediate thought is that in order for everyone to have access to the tools that we know can be very powerful and enabling, uh, we have to make sure that not only are, is the computing power reliably available and the networks connecting them also reliably available, but the digital content itself needs to be reliably available over time. And I am worried about that. I talked a lot about the digital dark age where digital content, which has been stored in some digital medium, is no longer accessible for one of two reasons. The medium has degraded and the, and the bits can't be read or the bits are readable, but the software that tells us what they mean no longer runs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 300 years from now, if somebody hands you a, a spreadsheet from say 2020, the question is, will you be able to do anything with it? Will it mean anything? Will the software be available? Have we uh, upgraded the recording of that spreadsheet over time? Or have we em emulated the old computers so that we could run the old operating systems and run the old applications so that old spreadsheet is still interpretable? And we have not invested heavily enough in uh, maintaining uh, the utility of digital content over significant periods of time so so th that is is pretty interesting so it's it's no longer just like a hardware issue it's also there's a software gap and it's a huge huge issue there yes exactly and uh, it's it's not about i mean finding your old photo it could be like really important stuff right so just uh, having that well, awareness well, might well yeah let I me mean, think about deeds of property deeds some of those we retain for a thousand years because they are having are important milestones of transfer of property. Uh, as Francesco in the chats is saying, uh, ten years of bank retention, for example, might be might be more. There are some things that we retain in our national history uh, that uh, have had to be retained for hundreds of years because we don't want to lose our history. And you want to have uh, your uh, progeny, you know, your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren might be curious about what was the world like when, you know, if your great-grandparents were around, uh, you'd like them to be able to at least uh, see what that was like, read about it, maybe see it, and maybe maybe even smell it and feel it. I mean, depending on how far we get in digitizing exactly. things. Exactly. I mean, uh, you, you, there's no there's no limits in terms of, uh, I mean, what you can imagine it will be to, to look back. Today, you look at a photo, you're only using your eyes. That stimulates emotion. How would that look in 20 years, 40 years from now? Um, which is actually a real use case. My mother always goes to these sites, to the ancestry and all of that, to, to get closer to... Um, to the family tree. Um, all right, we have quite a few questions. I'll quickly jump into uh, some of them. First thing, um, let's start with the kind of the retrospective as we do in Agile. Um, in hindsight, what went wrong? Uh, what did we miss uh, in the prisma of developing this massive kind of decentralized internet that we have today from your perspective? 
Well, of course, uh, I made the assumption that 32 bits would be enough to do the experiment, and it was enough to do the experiment, but it got out of the lab into uh, you know public use in 1989. And I had thought that we would simply, uh, once we demonstrated it, I thought that we would then do a production version, and the, the laboratory version got out, and so then we realized we needed so to do IPv6. It, it didn't really just get out. You actually intentionally... Um, it released it so that there's no yeah. barrier, right? So there's it, well, like, that yes. was option that was part of it, right? Yes, then, it, we hadn't we hadn't run out of address space at the time that you know, after all we turned it on in production in 1983. So by 1989, nobody had run out of any address space, and so I thought the only I wanted the general public to have access to this capability. What I didn't appreciate is how rapidly we would consume the address space. Uh, with the proliferating numbers of network. And so in 92, we realized that we needed to have a larger address space that led to the 1995 standardization of IPv6. And we're still pushing to try to get everybody to, to run you know, v6 uh, and, and I might have I might have you know there's a lot of uh, people tuned in and maybe take 20 seconds to say when we're talking about the 30-bit problem right we're talking about how I, an IPv4 so an IP an address of type IP with the version 4 is is comprised it has four octets right each one has eight bits uh, in in total 32 bits right um and you end up right you end up having um, a finite amount of uh, IP addresses you can leverage. Then we had all these types of solutions. So side arranges, changing the prefix length, subnetting, uh, internal versus external uh, IP addresses, different, uh, you know, classes of IP addresses. By the way, in Google and Google Cloud, we use any type of IP address from four to six, dual stack, single stack, uh, internal, external, in the VPC, out of the VPC, which is a lot of innovation happening there kind of, um, I know it's a problem, right? It's a problem, but it, it gets you creative about how to solve it, how to go around it. And well, I, I like that. That's my take from, from that matter. Well, yeah, but I would like to have something other than hacks to solve the problem. And IPv6 is uh, my preferred uh, outcome. By the way, we've concluded for the interplanetary backbone network, we are going to use IPv6 because there is enough address space for that. Uh, at the time that we chose 32, that was 4.3 billion terminations. That's more than there were people in the world in 1973. So we thought, surely that's enough uh, for now. But we were wrong. <laughs> I mean, you were right for that part. All right. Um, Eli Kaplan from Tel Aviv is asking, hi, Vint, computers are really just final uh, automatons, right? Automates. Uh, so uh, in my in my honest opinion, they can't ever be creative, even if Gen AI makes us think so. What you're thinking about the challenges that Gen AI can solve? Well, actually, I've had some discussions uh, at Google on this topic with people who know more than I do about generative AI. Uh, and I actually don't agree. Uh, let me explain why. Uh, the odd thing about these large language models is we all know that some of them hallucinate, by which I mean they put two and two together and they get five. Uh, they are juxtaposed things incorrectly. However, sometimes that is the source of creativity uh, when you juxtapose notions and ideas in ways that have never been ad made adjacent before, you may actually have some interesting properties. So some suggestions are that we allow these large language models to respond to our queries and prompting uh, with uh, recognizing that some of the things that they come back with are inappropriate or wrong but they may actually trigger some interesting new thinking uh, simply because of the mixing together of these ideas yeah. in a rich way. It's a little bit like imagining a giant room full of monkeys typing on the typewriter. The problem, of course, is that most of what they type is useless, but sometimes what they type might turn out to be a very new idea just because of the mixing together. So now the problem is figuring out which monkey is typing something that's worth looking at. And perhaps we will find tools that will allow us to discover the more interesting possibilities and, uh, and focus our attention on that. So I would not uh, reject out of hand the kind of creative hallucinating that goes on. It's just that we have to figure out how to filter that in a way that will uh, cause the useful ideas and the more interesting ones to be more visible. I also, I also feel that there's like... Um... 
a lot of innovation that can happen and occur in the prisma of separating the, like you said, the fees from the garbage pile. We're generating a ton of content, things that in, in you know, in speeds we haven't done before. And, uh, you know, you type, you type in a prompt to a Dal E, for example, which I love personally because it's very artistic. And then you have to separate, you take one photo out of maybe five prompts and use it, right? And, and doing that is, uh, is, is another um, uh, angle that we could look in, into innovation. How do we do that better? How, how can we optimize, maybe reduce the, the footprint of, of the content? Um, all right, Aurelian from uh, Paris is asking, hi, Vin, thanks for taking the time to present to us. By the way, Aurelian led the entire uh, track today for Infra, and he did a stellar job. Uh, so shout out to Aurelian. How do you think the internet will look in 10 years, he's asking, and are we moving towards a more controlled and more centralized internet, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think it will be more centralized. I do think that uh, people are concerned about concentration, but I would point out the internet is still extremely distributed. There are tens of thousands of networks that are underconnected to make this thing work. Uh, and we, of course, invest heavily in our network, but others do as well. Uh, so the network will continue to be highly distributed. Who is our network and, and theirs? Is this? Uh, uh, this is Google has a major network uh, that it builds in order to link all of its data centers together and also to link the data centers to the public internet uh, service providers so that consumers and uh, others can get access to our services. So uh, many of the companies that are in the online space are investing heavily in network development and uh, implementation. Of course, other things are happening during this next decade, especially the low Earth orbiting satellites like Earthlink and OneWeb and others. Those will provide access to the internet from literally every square inch of the surface of the earth, including out on the, on the water, which is 70% of the globe. Uh, and what that means is it may be hard to avoid access to the internet uh, if you were trying to uh, hide. Uh, but what that means is that it will be uh, available all the time, literally everywhere. And that will trigger a kind of reliance that we are already seeing today with mobiles uh, people are very much dependent on those mobiles functioning. Uh, the assumption is made for a lot of services that, of course, you have a mobile. Of course, it's online. Of course, it has apps. Uh, of course, you can use it for two-factor authentication. If, if that's not concrete enough, uh, imagine um, a, a day without electricity. That is like baked into the platform. I have to have that in order to to have my routine and, and so forth. So, uh, internet is becoming kind of the 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 electricity of of the current century, right? That's that is that is true. And I also worry, frankly, that we don't have enough resilience and redundancy. So I would like it to be the case that, uh, in addition to my laptop, that my pads and uh, and uh, mobiles can all substitute for each other. Uh, in performing these various functions, as opposed to being totally reliant on a single kind of device. Because when it doesn't work, all kinds of cascade failures can happen. By the way, this this um, uh, reminds me that we were speaking with the tech just before you joined in. And um, because it was really close to the hour and and we were kind of bantering, so we, someone mentioned that you might have internet uh, connectivity issues and he said well if the father of the internet has connectivity issues what would that mean <laughs> for the rest of us <laughs> so yeah um well just actually just because I, I am one of the early founders of internet doesn't mean that i'm any more any luckier than anybody else when it comes to internet access i've had my own set of uh you know challenges but the well, good news I just to make a point, though, that I've been very surprised at how well the telcos have done with the 5G mobile internet access. From time to time, local access has failed, and I've been able to recover thanks to the uh, alternative uh, on the mobile and little hotspots. So uh, redundancy is your friend here. De definitely, and, and that's, that's a great uh, point. Uh, also, Jamila mentioned connected cars as well. Um, all right, another question, um, Rafal is asking us, what do you think the next big thing is after LLMs and Gen AI in the IT and tech space? Uh, what could it be something that you would have that will be so transformative in its impact on business or our daily lives? I don't know if he's uh, um, a Googler or, or an investor, but I mean, the well, question. 
goes for both. Well, uh, let me, uh, first of all, I'll mention something which is not a Google project, but which Google permits me to work on. It's been alluded to already, and that's the interplanetary backbone network. The reason that is so important is that it's clear that without communications, there's no point in sending any space probes out because you'll never learn anything from that. So you need to be able to command, you need to be able to get stuff back. But what's even more important is that with the Artemis mission, the U.S. returned to the moon uh, with the ESA uh, participation in LunaNet and uh, Moonlight, among others, uh, that commercialization of space is on its way. Uh, NASA has already offered to purchase the output of mines from private sector entities mining the moon, as an example. So we're already on the cusp of commercialization. Eventually, of course, we'll see hotels in space and you know, there'll be uh, permanent laboratories or permanent moon bases and someday on Mars as well. We're talking, you know, several decades is, out. It's actually going to be like the current vision is for that to be like the, the new base for, you know, to, for the next hop, right? Uh, yes. And, and so what ha what's happening is that the commercialization is already upon us, which is quite exciting. It leads to all kinds of governance questions and other kinds of things. So that's one dimension. The second dimension, uh, looking towards the future, is what I'll call computational X for almost every value of X you can think of. Computational linguistics, astrophysics, biology, chemistry, all of those things are becoming part of a computing environment, which lets us explore solution spaces and speculate about their you know, various possibilities. These are empowering kinds of technologies, we'll accelerate our understanding of the way things work, thanks to the computational capacities that are uh, becoming available. Some of them, of course, coming from uh, data centers like the ones that Google and others are operating. But we're also starting to see another interesting swing. You know how the pendulum goes back and forth. Back in the day when we were working on the uh, internet and its predecessor, the ARPANET, the big thing was time sharing. Great big computers, time shared among multiple users. Then the computers got smaller and cheaper, and eventually we ended up with laptops and desktops and mobiles. And uh, then we built data centers out of those technologies, so we crammed bazillions of computers in one place. And then we said, oh, latency is a problem. Speed of light isn't getting any faster. So let's put computers in between the edge of the users, where the users are, and the data center, so we'll call that edge computing. The, and we'll the tiered put, approach. Uh, yeah, so exactly. So we're seeing computing just proliferating everywhere. Uh, and as I say, the pendulum keeps, keeps swinging back and forth. So that'll be and the next big thing, uh, structurally speaking, will be uh, edge computing capabilities. All right. That's a. I mean, thanks for the answer. That's actually a really good question. Um, all right. So um, let's talk a little bit about, about um, machine learning and AI again. Um, so what are like, uh, we, I mean, the, the main big questions are, um, around ethical AI, right? How do we ensure that the AI is good, um, is, is used for good and not for harm? How do we fight, uh, to ensure that AI is fair and unbiased if it's possible? Um, in also transparent, accountable, respects human rights, uh, to a minimum degree, of course. I mean, I mean, pragmatically speaking, what do you think we should do? as, as uh, engineers, scientists, innovators in that space? Well, there are several things going on. It's clear that we see harmful behaviors that are uh, exaggerated or, or facilitated by machine learning and, uh, and the generative AI. Let me point out to all of you that uh, it's not just the uh, machine learning world that's uh, troublesome. Any software that we rely on is potentially troublesome. It depends on the application for which it's being used. And so uh, I would argue we should create a kind of a matrix or at least a, uh, a layered uh, analysis that says if you're using a high risk, if you're using software of any kind, ML or otherwise, for a high risk uh, uh, application, there should be significant scrutiny of the safety and security and reliability of that software, whether it's machine learning or not. Uh, so if you're using something to guide a medical procedure, or to diagnose and uh, recommend treatment, um, or to control something whose failure might uh, lead to fatalities, 
uh, for example, automated uh, driving cars or even just trains that are on tracks, but they're fully automated. We want to make sure that software works well. You could even imagine an analog of the uh, civil engineer, the certified civil engineer in the software space where an application which has super high risk uh, is only um, can only be managed by someone who has been certified to work on such high risk applications uh, with you know suitable training and proof of uh, of capacity to uh, to work on uh, those risky applications. So I think we haven't done uh, as much as we need to do to judge how 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 much risk there is in the various applications and for high risk stuff. We want to hold companies and individuals accountable. Uh, for what other people are relying on them for that is a key by I mean I, I feel that that is like one of the the keys that that will hold the in kind of I wouldn't say solve but really allow us to progress in that in that vertical also what comes to mind is that dependency uh, it's you always have to look into that and what we do in software we try to decouple where we have that so um, I mean if you're you know in israel for example we use ways to navigate using you know driving from here to there what happens when you don't have that how do you how do you make sure you can get from a to b that's it's a problem well, nowadays right well yes if people don't know how to read maps so they don't have any maps nobody bothers we don't have any maps. Them. they don't bother printing them because we don't have the medium them. as we said before yeah. they don't yeah. sell any maps in the drugstore right. right yeah exactly now the, there is a different problem and that is what if you get bad directions from ways or from google maps uh, I, I have been misled from time to time, partly because sometimes you have streets that are on top of each other and the system doesn't know which of the two you're on because it doesn't have a Z axis. And so you're getting directions for the lower street, but you're trying to follow them on the upper street and it doesn't work. You know, turn right here. Oh, well, that puts you into the river. In, well, in the doesn't. U.S., one exit could be 50 miles apart from the well, you know, street yeah. back, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Los Angeles. Uh, you know, it, it, it went, it, wrong exit, you're 150 miles, you know, off the recovery. So, uh, so those, you know, those are all uh, considerations that, uh, that are, should color uh, our worry about dependency uh, on, uh, on software artifacts. All right, so um, it, Powell is, is asking, um, and he's very excited about the session, he writes, uh, what are your thoughts on Web3? And we also, it's interesting because you had an, an interesting answer to that in our previous session. What do you think about Web3? And well, that first of all, this is a buzzword. You know, I mean, it's just a marketing term. I guarantee you, Tim Berners-Lee was not thinking Web1, Web2, Web3, or anything like that. I mean, so what it represents, kind of, I guess. Yeah, yeah um, he's, he's kind of annoyed by that. Some people think that's oh, the metaverse. But, but but uh, I mean putting sarcasm aside aside yeah. and, and I get that I mean Web three for me decentralization um, how do we um, I mean build maintain create like these little type of you know tiny webs operated and owned by users focusing on content creators all of these good things even you know with or without the blockchain technology underneath it right that's well kind of I mean that's setting aside a rant on blockchain uh, for a moment let me tell you that this this notion of highly distributed uh, stuff may not work, and here's why. Uh, the, the reason that you see so much concentration right now is because somebody wants to take responsibility for maintaining and upgrading uh, the equipment that supports all those computations. If, if I am relying on you to store some of my information in your laptop and your laptop dies, you may not have much motivation for getting another laptop and then ingesting my stuff again. Uh, or, or backing it up or doing some other kinds of things. Whereas companies like Google and others are investing heavily in their infrastructure in order to maintain it and to upgrade it over time because it's part of the business. So yeah. some, of, some of what you're seeing in terms of concentration is driven by an economy of scale. Uh, and we should keep that in mind. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I, I I agree to what you're saying, and I think that um, it also reminds me that someone said that it's a three trillion uh, dollar industry in in search of a use case. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may, now let me let me suggest uh, an interpretation of Web three though uh, that uh, that might be um, interesting to uh, to think about. Uh, everybody uh, here probably understands what happens when your browser 
goes to a website. What does it do? It downloads a piece of software. Uh, and I, I think that's the correct way of saying it because if it's HTML5, that is a uh, von Neumann complete uh, language. It, 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 you can execute HTML5. So, uh, so what's happening is that we are moving pieces of software around and interpreting them uh, in the net. Now, up until now, it's been a pull kind of thing. Let's imagine for just a moment that it goes the other way around. Imagine that you could generate a piece of software that's intended to help you do something. AKA remote execution. Yes, and, and you might say, well, instead of moving the data to me, why don't I move the software to where the data is, let it process that software, and then come back and let me know what it found out. So Bob Kahn and I, in 1988, were writing about knowledge robots in the uh, digital object architecture where we would send software out to be interpreted at the target where the data was and then it would come back and assemble you know uh, the federated results into a common response so i'm actually quite excited about that possibility and it hasn't been deeply explored yet and and uh, just it, it's just it's super interesting to me and that was the incentive for that was this to because Throughput and bandwidth was was a challenge at the time, so you wanted to do that processing at the edge. Yeah, I mean, well, was... well. Also, some people didn't want their data to be transported anywhere. I mean, where have you heard that before? Uh, so the idea that that they would allow you access to the data for purposes of doing a computation, but not give you all of the data, uh, is in fact quite a reasonable position to take for certain situations. Suppose you've got data and it's scattered in different um, cloud systems. Well, you know, whether it's Google Cloud or Azure or Amazon or something else, you might actually want to be able to access that data in that cloud and then pull the com computed results back. So, you know, this is a, a place of real interest. Unfortunately, it also looks like a virus. I mean, if you think about how viruses propagate uh, or how, you know, uh, uh, you know worms, uh, software worms propagate, that's exactly what it does. So some people will run the other way and say, ah, that's scary. But if we do it right, um, if we have a, a transparency with regard to what the functionality of those uh, little mobile nobots happens to be, then I think we might actually be able to use that for some pretty powerful applications. I, 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 I totally agree. The next question from Taid is, is pretty uh, philosophical. Uh, so I understand you're fluent in IP, right? Uh, and <laughs> uh, in, in Taid is saying, uh, in many aspects, one can argue that the internet succeeded in uniting the world. So by speaking IP. So what are your reflections looking back and thoughts ahead? Well, it, it, it may have succeeded in allowing any computer to talk to any other computer. And by extension, computer mediated communication has allowed humans to communicate with each other. And thanks to machine learning, uh, particularly in its most recent incarnations, even people who speak different languages can communicate with each other because translation is starting to work well. Even live translation. Right? Right? Yes. Oh. And, then, and then even more interesting, for people who are not literate but who can speak, systems that can understand speech and can generate text-to-speech can enable people who may not be literate but may have, you know, uh, have questions they need answers to or things that they want uh, to be done, uh, may be able to enable that uh, through voice interaction. Now that leads to one other somewhat more scary possibility. You can see what's going on today in uh, machine learning space is that we're increasingly trying to support voiced interaction with the systems. The machine learning tools work with text primarily. They're capable of, of receiving sound and, and, and mapping it into text. But they uh, translate it, that internally yeah. to text. As right. Now, and we're building APIs for a lot of applications that will accept either text or, or spoken voice as input. What that means is that as we explore um, the uh, large language models that are capable of generating text, that means they can generate text which could be delivered to another application in order to cause something to happen. And so as we start uh, building on these tools, we end up with the possibility that a large language model could control other processes by way of generating text. 
So it's like yeah. saying, hi, Alexa, drop table users, right, in in, right. in that regard. Yeah, it, well, the, you, that or you know, tell it, please turn this television on or please order this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, object for me to be delivered or please plan this trip. And the, uh, all the systems that will do the planning may accept text as input on the API. So now we have this interesting question, just how much authority do we want to imbue uh, these machine learning applications with to do things on our behalf? And the scary thing, of course, is that um, if uh, your authentication is too weak, someone else could pretend to be you and use these tools to cause various things to happen in your name which leads us now to the desire for very strong authentication of identity so that others aren't able to pretend to be you. Do you want to be able to send a, a authorization which can be authenticated by the receiving party so they don't take an action inappropriately? So I, I and if that doesn't scare you enough, right? Um, think of the autonomous driving use case where you're in the car and you, the machine learning algorithm chooses how to drive uh, through the well, path. Well, keep in mind that if you look at the, our Waymo company, is our sister sister company in Alphabet, uh, there is a lot going on there. There is a great deal of machine learning uh, tools that recognize things. You recognize that you know there's a you know, somebody is moving in front of the car. Uh, Better than yeah. humans, right? I mean, the the yeah. data shows yeah. us that it's I mean less yeah. risk. Obviously. Yes, uh, but. Uh, how, however, the thing that's important here is that um, the cars are being trained using simulation as well as real, you know, live uh, experiences. Uh, should, as you say, uh, they may actually be able to do a better job than humans in terms of safety. Well, we are trying to teach them, of course, to not hit anything, uh, and and that's you know rule number one: don't hit anything. Uh, and rule number two, if you don't know what to do, pull off to the side of the road. Yes. It, by the way, that, that wouldn't work down here in Tel Aviv. I mean, uh, you have to be a bit more <laughs> well uh, yeah, I, in, in your, your driving efforts. Um, I, I, I would say that, that the uh, biggest challenge for self-driving cars would be downtown Mexico, uh, it, uh, uh, what, in India, for example, in Delhi where every mode of transportation is on the same road at the same time. People are walking, pulling carts, have three-wheeled vehicles and big lorries, and it's amazing. We haven't invented the, the, you know, the, the, the cameras yeah. and the LIDARs, and there's not enough chips in the world to, to handle that for, for right now. Um, all right, jumping on to the next question. Um, initially, the internet has been designed in a decentralized way to avoid the impact of centralized attacks. Uh, to that extent, how do you perceive the challenge on submarine cables uh, that have emerged along uh, with the war in Ukraine uh, by uh, Patris? Yes, that's a very good question. And one of the things that uh, many uh, companies that are heavy users of submarine cables are recognizing is the need to increase the resilience of that underlying system. We're so dependent on that. Anyone who's looked at maps from telegeography, for example, who has seen over the last decade a massive proliferation of submarine cables typically going east-west around the world, not too much north-south. That's increasing, but not as much as you would like. Over time, we might be able to build a more... Yes, we have inland connectivity. <laughs> more. That's right. That's right. So uh, there is a lot of interest now in figuring out whether we can build mesh type systems, including with, within the subsea environment, not just on land, in order to recover from cable cuts. So uh, the possibility of, of having a more mesh-like system with alternative routing uh, is very exciting. And of course, the, uh, uh, the existence of the low Earth orbiting satellites adds yet another dimension of potential recovery, although not at the moment at the data rates that you would typically encounter on the fiber. Although I just recently heard about a 200 gigabit per second demonstration between a low Earth orbiting satellite and the ground station, which is not inconsequential. It's not it's not the terabits per second that you get in a fiber system, but it's pretty significant bandwidth. I mean, especially if you compare that to the 
the high latency numbers that we're, we're accustomed to. And on that, oh, maybe one of the last questions that we have, what is like the, the latest or the, the, the newest thing um, in the inter interplanetary internet project? What are like the, the latest challenges that we're facing there? Well, when we started, we thought we would design and build a new protocol that would deal with the disruption and the variable delay, which is constant, you know, a significant delay, like 40 minute round trip times to Mars, which is TCP doesn't do well with that. Um, however, recently we've now looked at the most likely scenarios and they include the propagation of inter internet protocols in small, you know, within a, a laboratory or a moon base or within a spacecraft. Uh, or, you know, something on Mars. And so we're imagining little pieces of internet scattered all around the solar system, interconnected by the bundle protocol backbone. And so now we're starting we'll to- Well, stack, think, as, yeah, as Yeah, literally. And, and it's not, it's, well, it isn't exactly dual stack though, uh, because the bundle backbone is at, literally going to be encapsulating <laughs> the uh, applications. These would be application layer gateways running on top of the bundle protocol taking email out of the internet, putting the email into a bundle, for example, and then pushing the bundle to a target on earth, let's say, which pops back into the internet and goes to the appropriate mail server. So we're looking at application space, mixing the local internet uh, service with the backbone capabilities. So now we have to do double routing. We have to do local routing within the internet. We have to figure out, okay, so which bundle node do we have to route to to get it to the right planet or the right spacecraft or the right moon or asteroid or wherever it's going. So this is turning out to be even more interesting than I had expected uh, as, as opposed to just running BP on everything. All right, super interesting. Um, I think we're kind of uh, at time. Uh, and uh, Vin, thank you so much. You've covered so many uh, questions that we had today. It was an absolute delight to, to host you once again. I feel that we have to we have to have Bob next time with us, right? I mean, if that's possible. I mean, I'm, well, he's local. In fact, three of us are in the local area here in the DC area. Bob Kahn is here. Steve Crocker, who is the lead oh. for the network working group on the ARPANET project, and I are all within a couple of miles of each other here in the DC area. So it's entirely possible. Of course, you don't need us to be physically co-located because you know we've got the internet. But uh, who ever complained with uh, for a low, a low latency environment, right? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's true. If we could all be together in the same place, then we'd have low latency among us while we're interacting with you. <laughs> all right. Uh, again, Vin, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to me today. We're, I mean, flabbergasted by the amount of information. Well, uh, thank really you so much. You asked very good questions. I hope my answers were uh, were uh, adequate. Uh, and in any case, it made me think a lot. And I always enjoy that. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great so day, the day in the week. And uh, congratulations, by the way. Thank you very, very much. Take care, everybody. See you on the net. <laughs>